If your creative push has helped you, you can help out this show by shopping on Amazon. Just head to yourcreativepush.com slash Amazon. That will take you right to amazon.com and you can do your shopping. It won't cost you anything extra and a percentage of your purchases will go directly to helping to host your creative push. And especially with the holidays coming up, you can make a big difference just by buying the stuff that you are going to buy anyway. Again, the link is yourcreativepush.com slash Amazon. And thank you so much for thinking about the show and for helping out. Your Creative Push, episode 312. If you don't do anything, then nothing will ever happen. So it's better to create bad stuff than it is to not create anything. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Marco Bucci. Marco is an artist and illustrator whose experience includes books, film, animation, and advertising, and his clients include Walt Disney Publishing Worldwide, Lego, LucasArts, Mattel Toys, Fisher-Price, Hasbro. This list goes on and on, so I'm going to stop there. But he's also a teacher and currently teaches the art of color and light at CGMA, and he also teaches on his YouTube channel, which I have been kind of obsessed with <laughs> since I uh, invited him on the show, uh, because he has a passionate and eloquent way of uh, explaining difficult concepts, as you're going to see in today's episode. Marco discusses how he learned how to learn to draw and the way in which he pursued art after abandoning it as something that he wasn't as good at as the other people who, quote, could draw. And in that way, he also talks about how the path to your goal is never a straight line, and how you should embrace the fact that the path will be curved. Marco also discusses the labor of love that is his YouTube channel and the way in which he plans and structures his YouTube videos. He also talks about trying to solve problems before starting a piece of art and how to avoid paralysis during the creation process. Marco and I also discuss his book, Creativity in the Campfire, and the difference between art and creativity and how we're all born with creative curiosity and don't question it or our skills until later. Marco also discusses his short film, Cindy, that he worked on with his friend Bryce Sage. And finally, the battle between hard work and fun, something we are all trying to figure out. Again, I had so much fun talking with Marco. He has a great way of describing things, and I learned a ton in this episode and a ton from his YouTube channel. So I know that you as well are going to be inspired by my conversation with the one and only Marco Bucci. Marco, welcome to Your Creative Push, man. Hey, Youngman. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. No, thank you so much for being here. I think that you are one of those people, one of those artists that um, contributes a lot, not just uh, with your own beautiful art, um, but also your kind of voice for creative people to help other creative people, not just with their actual art, um, but with like this whole messy creative thing that we uh, all try to deal with. So I'm really looking forward to speaking with you today. Yeah. Oh, thanks. That's uh, a lot of that comes from my teaching stuff. I've, I'm an artist, of course, but I also am a teacher. And I just noticed that there's so many things beyond the acquisition of skill that artists uh, stumble around with, including me. So I just try and shed some light on that as much as I can. Well, much appreciated. And I can't wait to get into it. I always like to give my guests the opportunity at the start to uh, kind of give us a brief overview, sort of how you got to the point you are today, uh, creatively speaking. Uh, sure. Okay. Well, I, I guess, uh, as a, let's go way back and then I'll fast forward real quick. Perfect. So when I was a kid, I was always jealous of, of the other kids who could draw because I was never that guy. I was, I didn't have the, uh, the inborn talent, I guess, to draw. So, uh, my jealousy became, uh, a stubborn resolve to figure out this whole drawing thing. And, um, I just started, drawing, even though I couldn't draw. I never, at the time, I never realized that drawing was a skill you could actually learn. So I thought I was doomed from the start, but it turns out, thankfully, that you can learn to draw. <laughs> and we can fast forward now to 2001. I found my very first, uh, I was accepted to film school. I didn't, I applied to animation school, but I couldn't draw. So I couldn't pass the portfolio requirements, but I went to film school. I had some like 
digital portfolio, like Photoshop stuff. I got into film school and I love film. So, uh, and then from there, I found a drawing studio that offered, uh, life drawing classes, you know, where you draw from the nude model. So I signed up immediately. It was just down the street from where I went to school. Uh, and I attended class uh, about three times a week. And that teacher, his name is, uh, Nick Kalislian. He's the guy who taught me how to learn to draw. He taught me some basic skills, but I was so new that I, you know, I couldn't really apply them right away. But he's the guy who kind of showed me the way, I guess. He was the uh, the original sensei. And then from there, I just, it was, you know, I guess uh, the cliche goes, the rest is history, and I'm still on that path. Right. And you said an important thing there, how to learn to draw. And I think that's an important distinction for a lot of uh, creative people, regardless of what they do. It's it's not just learning to do it. It's learning how to learn to do it, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like for just to put a tangible kind of reality to that, the, the first thing I, the first thing he deconstructed for me was, you know, in life drawing class, a, a figure, a model poses and you have to draw, right? So I thought that you sit there and you, you basically trace an imaginary uh, picture on your paper as you draw. And, and Nick, um, again, my teacher's like, no, you don't do that. You break it down like structurally and gesturally. I, I'm sure your listeners, young men, know what a gesture drawing is. I, that was alien to me in 2001. I did not know what a gesture drawing was. And uh, Nick was the guy who's like, you know, with a gesture, you're not worried about making a, a good or finished drawing. You're just wor- you're just worrying about feeling the the flow of the pose, the weight, the the action, whatever it is the the model is doing, and just very flowy, abstract lines. And like anyone can do that. I mean there's levels of ability there too, but anyone can do that and not have to worry about doing a finished drawing. So that was one of the things that he did where he taught me how to learn, how to break down what I'm seeing into like digestible parts. Right. And you, you also mentioned that story, um, you know, from an early age, like wanting to draw, but then like realizing that you couldn't do it. I think a lot of people that holds a lot of non-artists that probably aren't listening to this podcast. I don't know how to get them to like listen to this podcast because it's not like on the forefront of their mind. They keep pushing it back They're At one point they just said, Oh, I can't draw. And then that was it. <laughs> they threw in the towel. What did you do in the, in the meantime, um, between that, that, kind of initial realizing that, you know, you weren't as good as the other kids at drawing until you mm-hmm. finally kind of went for it and decided to to learn how to draw. So I, I in my woes of not being able to draw, I, I still was in love with art and uh, I discovered the computer, 3D art. And uh, this was about the time Toy Story came out in 1995. So I thought that, hey, <laughs> hey, the computer draws for you. So why don't I just <laughs> skip the whole nuisance of drawing and just go straight to the computer? And while that, I think that's kind of flawed thinking, it did give me an outlet for, it made me able to bypass the whole notion of drawing. And it got me thinking about uh, art in other terms. Like it got me thinking about three-dimensional space and form and composing a shot. And even though it was... I would later learn it was a mistake to bypass drawing and just give up on it like that. Uh, the computer provided me my first uh, first few years of like, you know, digging my heels into this whole world of art. And uh, to this day, I'm, I, I'm actually just returning to some of my old 3D skills uh, right now, actually. So that's what I did for a number of years before uh, discovering life drawing. Right. Well, and I was watching one of your videos and you were talking about like kind of the path to becoming like the thing that you want to do um, mm-hmm. and that there is no set path. And sometimes it is as simple as, you know, just getting into one aspect of the general direction that you want to go um, because – so often we emulate the people that really inspire us and we try to get to like exactly their style, but you'll never get exactly that style. Like you create your own all along the way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That was uh that's kind of a stumbling block. I, I see a lot and it kind of relates to what I said earlier about intangible elements to learning to be an artist. Uh, like everyone has their own favorite artist. Um, and you want to paint or draw like them. That's only natural. Everyone's everyone can, uh, can relate to that. However, you, a lot of people then draw a line from where they are to a straight line from where they are to where their, you know, their favorite artist is. And they try and follow a straight line. Like, Oh, X concept artist does cool aliens, uh, you know, spacecrafts. Therefore I should learn to draw spaceships. Well, no, because learning to draw spaceships is not just about drawing spaceships. You should learn how to draw a cylinder first. You should learn how to construct a cylinder into like something that you can see every day, like a human arm. Uh, you know, you can build an arm out of cylinders. Maybe that will help you understand form. And then then maybe you stumble into 3D software where you can arrange 3D forms. And then maybe that takes you 
to lighting and where you understand how light hits form. And then with all those skills, now maybe you can draw a spaceship. So it, there's, the line is not straight. It, it curves. And the video you're referencing, Youngman, was I was just talking about don't try – if you catch yourself drawing that straight line, just stop and, and allow yourself to maybe meander a little more. And um, a lot of people also couple that with the pressure of getting a job, like they want an art job. So again, they see a lot of concept artists artists doing like cool sci-fi concepts. So what do they do? They start trying to do sci-fi concepts. But a lot of times, many people uh, start doing that without having like the backing of, of, of all the basics. Like again, figure, I'll always go back to figure drawing or just constructing basic forms out of your imagination. And then after that, after you've kind of mastered that, well, you never master anything, but after you've, got, you've gotten pretty good at that, now go ahead and try and use that knowledge to construct, you know, fantasy sci-fi landscapes. So, right. And if you if you get right to the goal or right to that thing that inspires you uh, that you really want to do as well, you might stymie your creativity as well. Like the fact that you can develop these skills to draw, you can literally draw anything like you can create anything anything that's in your imagination and uh when you um set this like one thing like you said we'll use a, the example of spaceships you just start drawing spaceships and all you draw is spaceships it's like all your mind is really thinking about is spaceships and not like going out into the world and looking around and and being inspired by everything else yeah that's exactly it and i for me at least my favorite artists they all bring like a the essence of their own life into the work and you know if you love spaceships that's awesome but chances are in your life you're not going to see many spaceships you're going to experience other mundane things like you know going through a walk uh with your wife or husband in the park or you're gonna like eat ice cream a lot like those things can inform your art way more than like the super esoteric stuff can because you experience it every day so i think life is where you should find most of your inspiration and then you can morph it into into anything that's what art is you're like taking life experience and changing it into something you know for an audience hmm. i love spaceships though <laughs> <laughs> they are i want to cool. be on They're that cool. flight to the moon with uh with uh spacex man i, I want to be on that flight <laughs> Yeah, when is that? Is that I, I only only know a little bit about that. When is that actually going? Oh, uh, I think like twenty twenty three, maybe twenty twenty one. I don't cool. know. I want to be on it. My wife is already not letting me apply. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's a bit expensive. If I had to guess. No, well, it's free. This this Japanese billionaire paid for a flight, and uh, he's bringing artists with him. So anybody oh, that's interested, look into it if you want to go to the moon. <laughs> oh wow! Well, this is news to me. Maybe I can get my oh. wife to uh, let me go to the moon. Jump on it, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about your YouTube videos um, because okay. I think you provide an excellent resource, a free resource for people, um, especially artists too. A and you also, um, the way that you describe sometimes very difficult concepts, uh, you do it in a very eloquent way. Um, so you, you've got a great way of explaining things as well as editing, and I really uh, enjoy your channel. Um, when did that start and why did you start that YouTube channel? Well, first of all, thanks a lot. I really appreciate the kind words on that. Uh, oh, the sure. YouTube channel is definitely a labor of love for me. And, um, you know, it's grown quite a bit in the last year, which is awesome. I started way back in 2000, I think 2009 is my first video, which is still on there if you want to go back and watch it. I believe it's dated 2009. And it's terrible. But why did I start? <laughs> um, I was just... I don't know. I've always had a, a liking for presentation. I've all, like, un, this is where I differ from a lot of people. I really enjoyed public speaking in, uh, in grade school. Like I loved it. I don't know what it is. I've always liked getting on a stage and like delivering a message either with uh, speaking or I, I've played in a few bands over the years, just growing up. For some reason, I like, I really value the act of communicating. And that's really what art is at its heart. So that's why I started. Uh, I just wanted to paint something and talk about it. Um, now, again, those videos back in 2009 are, by my standards now, are not good at all, but that was where it started. Right. Well, that's what happens with everything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> You got to exactly. start somewhere. And uh, if if you don't look back, or if you, if you look back and you're not kind of eh about it, like, then you're not progressing. <laughs> so it's always a good, th a good sign. <laughs> that's true. I'm always wary of artists who, who can look at their own work and be like, yeah, I nailed that. <laughs> I, I have never had that thought in my life. Yeah, for sure. Well, so since you created that that channel, and I know how it is for like me as a writer or artist like you, once you start something, you can't stop but see the world mm -hmm. in that way. Um, does that ever affect you for as you're creating your own art? Does it ever 
almost become a drag because you're like, all right, now there's this whole other thinking process that I have to incorporate into this, like maybe setting up a camera, like doing the actual physical stuff of like, okay, here's my progress shots or here's my progress video or my time lapse. Uh, here's, you know, my materials. Like, does that ever um, feel like a drag to you to, to incorporate that other kind of thinking mentality to it? Uh, you mean like showing, sorry, I mean, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, so like, for example, like you're, you did a, a video about like your, one, one of your watercolors. Um, okay. I, I forget where it was at, maybe Copenhagen. Copenhagen was, was the latest one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like you pretty much showed the entire progress of, of you creating that, that drawing or that painting, that watercolor. Yeah. Um, yeah. So does that ever like the whole setting up a camera and thinking about what you want to talk about afterwards? Um, does that ever feel like a drag? Uh, no, I actually really love that part. Um, so I, first of all, you're, you're a writer obviously, and I really respect writers. I think writing, uh, just a quick tangent here. I think personally, I think writing more than painting is the most direct way of, of uh, putting what's in your brain onto something tangible. Like you can write it, you know, anyone can write a sentence very quickly, whereas not anyone can draw a picture very quickly. So I think writing is the most, uh, the quickest route we have from our brain to a page. And as a, I guess my YouTube channel, one of the things it's done for me as a creator is um, it's forced me to write. So I really actually enjoy the process of planning out my videos. I, I literally do write them like, physically on a page. I have a little notepad that I carry with me everywhere. And in that notepad, I I make notes like, you know, uh, I don't really write notes about camera work, but I, I write notes about like, uh, introduce the video with this. This is like act one. If you're talking like a movie, this is act one. Act two is the painting. In that painting, I want to talk about X, Y, and Z, uh, you know, with an overall theme of, of whatever. Uh, and then in part three, I will sum up my thoughts with this kind of thing. So I, I structure out my videos in writing and I find that it's so fun to like mold the video that way. And then when it comes to the actual technical production, um, I really enjoy it because I have a plan. I think if I made my videos with no plan, it would kind of be a drag like you, like you alluded to, but, um, because I enjoy the planning process, cause that's really where the creativity is for me. It, uh, it makes the YouTube stuff really enjoyable. Yeah. And what about uh, anybody listening right now? Perhaps they don't want to necessarily start a YouTube channel, but would you have any suggestions for them to be able to tap into that thing that you're talking about, about being able to kind of plan out not just your, your art, but like the way that you create, even if it is just like kind of writing it down, journaling, planning it out? Yeah. Um, I think it's possible to get paralysis with planning. Like, you know, you, you plan so much and then when it comes to production, you're just, your planning is so sacred that you don't want to do it. I've run into that trap trying to write my own stories. Like I've planned the story on a cork board, then I don't want to write it because I feel like I can't go beyond the cork board phase. Um, mm -hmm. with, with create, with creative stuff though, like writing or filmmaking or art, my biggest recommendation is to make sure you devote at least some time of your day, if you can, every day uh, to it. Like even if it's just a, a few minutes a day, get that stuff going. Um, even if you're going to throw it out tomorrow, get something down today because a big part of the creative, creative process is discovery and you have to be able to uh, make a right turn when you should have gone left and only discover that later. Also, um, I've found a great deal of inspiration from analyzing like the structure of things this just is personal, but I have a, like I mentioned earlier, I have a deep respect for good communication. And I think at the heart of that is structure. Any communication is, is well structured, be it a film, a speech, an essay, whatever it is, a, a good podcast. Um, like, like you, young man, you sent me uh, in advance, not to reveal it behind the curtain too much, but you sent me the structure of your podcast before we started recording. And that, uh, you know, I really respect that. And it really helped me to know what was going to happen, even though we didn't plan the words we're going to say. So I just think like, uh, look at your favorite art or whatever you want to do and try and analyze it for structure. Like what is it that's holding it up? And chances are, it's not going to be the style of the thing. The style is always comes at the end. When it comes to painting, look for like the basic passage of like light and shadow. That's a structural thing the artist has put in there. Look at the shapes. How are the shapes designed? Is there a repetition of shape? Is Are there contrasty shapes? Are there contrasty values? Where are the values not contrasty? Those are all structural things that you don't necessarily need to be a master to analyze. You can just look at a piece and analyze it. And if you want to write stuff down, go ahead. Or if you want to do a little drawing study of it, if you're looking at a painting, then do a drawing study. 
But getting yourself into the structure of things, I think, is what will help you progress the most because then structure, you can apply any to anything. Like we talked about spaceships before, you can you can take the structure of a figurative drawing by Claire Wendling and apply it to a, a spaceship drawing. Like structure is something that you can put anywhere. Right. Yeah. And just like the, the outline for this podcast or creating a watercolor like in your video, having a plan beforehand because you, d- you know that you have limited time when you're uh, working with watercolors and it's unforgiving. And also you knew beforehand where you wanted your focus to be like you wanted your focus, the viewer's focus to be on the boats and yeah. not the buildings. So then when you're working on the buildings, you're like, all right, I'm not going to spend too much time like really putting too many hard colors in here, too many dark colors, too much structure in here because I don't want to like this isn't the the point of it. Like to know that it kind of takes the pressure off when you are creating those things and like being able to focus in during the entire piece. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. So again, so structurally I try and solve as many problems as I can beforehand. Now, you can never solve all of them. If you can if you're solving all of them all the time, you're probably using a formula which is no good. But if you you know, I give you uh, in that YouTube video you're talking about, which is called sketching with focus, if anyone is wondering. We'll link it up in the show notes page. Oh, cool. I appreciate it. Thanks. That video, yeah, talks about what I'm thinking about before going in. Because if anyone here has used, <laughs> has used watercolor, you know it's the most unforgiving tool on the planet. Like you, you cannot really course correct once you've begun. It, to a degree, you can, but it's not like oil paint where you can literally scrape it off your canvas and start fresh. Uh, Certainly not like digital where you have undos and layers. With watercolor, you kind of have to go uh, with the flow, no pun intended, uh, (laughs) and you have to – and uh, it really demands that you think about what you're doing before you do it. So for me, uh, as a structural loving nerd, it's really the ideal medium for me because it really forces that kind of thinking. But if you you notice in that video, young man, after I do that painting – I break it down structurally in terms of what I what it is I created on a structural level, like what it, what was my value pattern, for instance, what were my edges like. I take my painting and I kind of do a po- post mortem on it, where I break it down and I try and find structural elements that don't work, and then I improve them. So um, I do that all the time, and that's exactly so. In, that video is actually encapsulates pretty well what I recommend for um, beginner to novice artists, even advanced artists. You know, you never figure it all out. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it is important to do that postmortem thing. I think perhaps sometimes either people are perfectionists and they just keep working on it, just keep working on little details. They don't have distance from it or they just say, all right, it's done <laughs> and they don't do that. Um, so I think it is very important to have this kind of, you know, that you're going to have this time later when you're kind of reach the end point of, of the painting or whatever it is that you're doing, you know that you have time to go back and analyze it. So you're not worried about it the whole the whole time you're creating. You're not being a perfectionist the entire time. You're like, all right, this is fine. I'm gonna worry about this later. If it's a mistake, yeah, but I'm not yeah. gonna let it I'm not gonna freak out and let let it take over um the entire process, you know? Yeah, exactly. And that's something that I not to use the same word again, but a lot of people get paralyzed by um that kind of worry where they're creating something and you know like a painting they'll put down a a color or a value and they'll like they'll start fretting over it and like oh is that the right color value just don't worry about it just just move on pretend it like it is the right value and color and then put something next to it and then put something next to it or if you're doing some writing put down some words then put down more words don't edit the words you just did put down more 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 and then edit it all later uh and and see if what you did matches how you experienced a scene, for instance, which is what I talked about in my watercolor video, how you experience a scene versus what the scene actually is. But you can only evaluate that stuff after all the elements are in place. Uh, there's a, a big cliche of comparing painting to, to a jigsaw puzzle is there, but it's an apt comparison because painting is very much like a jigsaw puzzle in that there's so many little pieces, little shapes, like literal shapes in a painting, just like there are shapes in a jigsaw puzzle. In a jigsaw puzzle, you would never put a couple shapes together and evaluate your progress. You know you're only at the beginning. So in a painting, <laughs> just put down more than two pieces, man. Put down like 150 pieces or, you know, I'm speaking figuratively here. And then look back on it as a whole. Step back and then see what those 150 pieces are doing. And then you might remove 30 of them or or whatever. You might need to add a few. Chances are you'll need to remove a few because no one gets it all right right away. But um, that's the discipline for me. Yeah. That's so true with the puzzle. I love I love that example. Um, 
So we were talking about writing a little bit, and mm -hmm. uh, we scheduled this interview a few weeks ago, and uh, I've been watching your videos and stuff, and, you know, kind of slowly, you know, preparing for the, this conversation. And then last night, I wanted to write down, you know, your website, get all the details, write down your books and stuff like that. And I stumbled mm -hmm. across this book you wrote, <laughs> this gem of a book that you wrote called Creativity in the Campfire. And I... I bought it and I read it all <laughs> last night. Oh, well, thanks, man. Wow, that's <laughs> awesome. Is, Thank you so much. Well, it, oh, it's the perfect compliment for this podcast and anybody that's listening definitely needs to check it out because, I mean, I don't know if you – do you consider yourself a writer because you have written a book here at least that is like <laughs> f uh, leaps and bounds beyond other creativity books that I've read. Um, it's so good. Uh, I, I would compare it to uh, Pressfield's War of Art or anything else that he does, uh, just with more detail, because he's I think he's a little bit too to the point. Um, but you explain things very eloquently, and uh, I highly recommend it. We'll link it up in the show notes page, but I have a lot of questions anyway about creativity in the campfire that I'd like to ask you. Man, well, thanks so much. Yeah, of course, man. I mean it. That is humbling. Thank you so much. So I wanted to start out with talking – you talk about the difference between creativity and art. And um, I think this is an important distinction that a lot of people don't really think about and kind of the thesis of, of your book. But um, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you're right. That's introduced, I think, literally on page one, the difference. Creativity to me is like – is something that everyone innately has. It's the ability to think of something, an idea, some inkling of an idea – and explore it. Like, oh, I love walking in the park. I wonder if there's a story where you're walking in the park and a witch appears and and this and that. That's that's the creative thing. Like anyone can do that. You don't need talent to do that. Every single child is creative. I, I you know, I, I don't know the science behind it, but that's what I think anyway. The art part is the stuff that's related to drawing skill. Like, okay, What's the structure of the skull so I can draw this portrait? How do I understand the shoulder girdle so I can draw this figure? And you make art with that. Those are skills that lead to the art. But the creative part, the idea to draw a cool figure holding a sword with this thing in the background, that's the stuff that's inborn. Every, everybody has creative ideas and everyone can explore creative ideas. And, and the book is a largely about, uh, I guess the, the theme of the book is kind of the confusion uh, between those two, a lot of people say don't have the drawing skill or, or are frustrated with their drawing skill. And they equate that to a lack of creativity when really the two are separate, in, in my opinion. Um, you should not confuse them. Um, the, the skills happen over time, but the creative stuff, you know, I'm sure everyone here when they were a kid was drawing stories and writing stories. I know I was like everyone I know was. The book, the book is largely about illustrating that difference and, and just my own tips based on, you know, the hundreds of students I've taught over the past 10 years, like noticing trends uh, of, of different thought processes and how to navigate them as best as I know how and things like that, you know, developing skills versus uh, kindling creativity, etc. You mentioned, you know, the whole kid thing. And uh, we talk about it all the time on the podcast. And it's like, it's one of those basic things that people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, like when we're born, we're, we're creative, and we don't have those resistances. But it's like, mm -hmm. I think it's like one of these important points that people just gloss over. It's the fact that, you know, we're innately supposed to be creative, we're supposed to like, really dive deep and lose ourselves in art and figuring out like, uh, what the world looks like and what our place in the world is. And that thing gets stomped out at some point for everybody, I think. Um, it's mm -hmm. just a matter of like battling against the world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like for yeah. you, like r thinking that, you know, you can't draw. So like you have this long gap where you don't try. And uh, I, I do agree that the, the creativity we're all born with, but the art, the art making, it takes work and it takes like hard work and pushing past resistances or you call them uh, inner inquisitors, <laughs> which yeah, I like yeah, yeah. Um, pushing past all those things. It's kind of the basis of this podcast, but it's like so important for people to remember that like when you were a kid, all you wanted to do was create like you wanted to, to find your place, you know? Yeah. So you, you nailed it. Young man. I totally agree. I think, um, you know, the natural progression of everyone is we learn how to question ourselves. You know, when you're a child, you don't know how to do that yet. You're just completely dependent on everything. And, you know, you, I guess, I guess in a way, uh, children are perfect that way because they don't know, they don't even know enough to know that they're not perfect. So you don't question anything, but past a certain age, you begin to understand that you can 
question yourself. And that in- includes like your skills in certain things. So uh, the second that comes into the equation, many people give up on creativity or creative uh, outlets because all of a sudden now you're not good enough at drawing. So, and th- I went through this, uh, so I'm not good enough at drawing. Well, I guess I'm not going to draw anymore uh, because I can't, you know, I can't make money at it or I'm not as good as John over there, or whoever it is. Well, in the book, it's Tim. <laughs> um, <laughs> got it. Got a fact check here. Make sure. You yeah. Get the right yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for those who read the book, you know, the Tim story, but um, yeah. So like, well, just to quickly, it, it, it's a good example. Tim was a kid in my fourth grade class who he was really good at drawing. And uh, it was, to make a long story short, looking at Tim's drawings, I just concluded that, well, I'll never be that good. Like I'm so far away from him that I might as well just not do it. Like I tried to be as good as him. I even tried to copy one of his drawings and I couldn't do it. I made the conclusion from that, that I should not draw, which is like, that's, that's a terrible shame, man. That's a huge shame because like you said, we're all born with the desire to create and so many of us like snuff out our own flames and it's just a tragedy. I don't necessarily think that you that everyone should be a professional artist for a living. Like that's not the goal. And that's another problem. Like with today, people who want to do art, for some reason it comes like linked with a job or something. Like don't don't think of it that way. You can, like if you really want to endeavor to be a professional artist, which is what I do. I, I'm a professional artist. That that's cool, but like don't let the job part supersede the just the um, uh, reward that can come from just being open to exploring certain things like, you know, take out a notebook and start jotting down notes for a story idea or, you know, start building some drawing skills and apply them to, to that story. And over time, you know, it's it just so rewarding. I know this for a fact. Like I, I was not always good at drawing. Like I, like I said, I couldn't, I couldn't draw when I was a kid. And even today I still struggle with so many things, but the reward comes from, um, constantly getting up, putting in the work and trying to, uh, trying to get the skills up to the point where I know my, you know, where I know we're all born with a certain level of creativity. And I try and always push my skills up to that level that I can like, uh, satisfy my creative passions, I guess. Sorry, I went on a huge tangent there. No, no, that makes a lot of sense. It's a, it's a good tangent. <laughs> and like you said in the book, art goes in circles anyway. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So sorry, that sorry. That's the, that's the other thing. Um, and by the way, if anyone's wondering, because I was able to edit the book, the book is written better than I'm speaking. <laughs> that's, the, hey, that's, that's, problem, that's the problem with speaking. You can't go back and edit. Dude, I'm the same way, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, the whole thing about circles, like that's the other thing with creativity and, you know, thinking of ideas and bringing them to fruition. You never know the way, like just because you painted one masterpiece, it doesn't mean you, like you can't just repeat that for the next one. You have to explore from scratch all over again we all probably can think of bands or artists who do the same thing over and over like a band whose songs start sounding all the same Uh, that's because you get complacent you get lazy and this happens to everyone i really try my best with every project i do to not repeat the thing i just did even if the thing i just did was like a huge hit i try and not repeat that um and it's a challenge i have for myself because that's that's the other thing about creativity even though we're all born with it it can die. You can kill your own creativity. And one of the ways is to abandon your creative outlet. The other way is to rely on the same formula over and over. Speaking of hard work, and you know, you also mentioned that it doesn't have to be work. You don't have to find a job. Like It should just be fun. In your book, you mentioned that kind of battle of hard work versus fun. And I think you, you came up with an elegant solution of just showing up. So could you talk about that? Because I think it's like an important lesson that is sometimes uh, seems too simple. Yeah. So that goes, again, that kind of thematically relates back to structure. Just the way I structure my life and the way I notice any art, any successful artist structures their life is they just show up every day. They do something every day. And and when I say something, like I, I literally mean just a few minutes a day that that qualifies. That's fine. If you're a professional artist like me, you have to show up for eight hours a day. But if you're a hobbyist, if if you work at a bank, but you harbor dreams of like drawing your own graphic novel, a lot of people will wait for like, oh, only when I'm on vacation, I can dedicate a week to drawing. Don't do that. Get home from your job and like draw for five minutes. Like I know people, I know life is busy. Like I I have a busy life too. uh, People have husbands, wives and kids and and jobs. Uh, Finding time is hard. That's that's that what kills a lot of people's creativity because they just don't they don't nurture it. But the whole, you know, the visual of like a fire, you have to always feed it. You have to or else it dies. And creativity is like that. So 
uh, the hard work part, the showing up part, just try and do something every day. Um, even keeping a notebook on you and like doing little scribbles in a notebook that counts, you know, that as long as you're engaging that part of your brain every again, I recommend every day, but it doesn't have to be every day. There's, I'm not sure if there's any science behind that, but I try and every day, just do something, just make a note. If I'm not drawing, make a note about something or, you know, and that might turn into a YouTube video, you know, three months later. That's how, uh, my, my most recent YouTube video as we record, this is a, a lesson uh, about, uh, color and um, I make a uh, analogy with wine tasting. Well, that wine tasting analogy dates back about four months ago or five months ago. I was doing a wine tasting tour with some friends and I noticed that the way the instructor was talking about wine was very similar to how I think about color. So I just made a few notes and like those notes took me two seconds to make, but they flowered into like a video five months later. It, so, you know, don't think that everything is, isn't connected because everything is. Well, as the listeners know, I'm a huge proponent of, you know, writing those ideas, like plucking them out uh, mm -hmm. before they disappear, even if you don't know exactly what it's going to end up being, if it's going to be a blog post, if it's going to be a painting, if it's going to be a song, whatever, um, just, just get them down. Hopefully yeah. you can look back later and see where it does actually fit into your kind of creative life that you hopefully, like you said, are living every single day and getting to every single day. Yeah. Can I interject with a quick question for you, young man? Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So like just on that topic... Do you notice a pattern or a certain um, problem or stumbling block that, that people you talk to have or people you've noticed or yourself or anything like that? A common one? Common resistances? Yeah, yeah. Uh, imposter syndrome for sure. I think that's mm. something that that everybody deals with uh, regardless of your kind of stage in your creative journey. Um, imposter syndrome, like who am I to do this? <laughs> yeah. Like I think that almost every interview, <laughs> like I'm talking right now to Marco, who's like a wonderful artist and who am I to be discussing like art making, like painting, um, all, you know, the only skills I have are of watching your videos or watching other artists videos. And I like that, <laughs> but at the same time, who am I to like, have like this conversation yeah. with an expert in it? You know, um, who am I to be, tackle creativity, <laughs> this like right. massive problem that every, every human has from, from the womb and trying to like battle that. That self-questioning thing that we talked about. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. What about you? What are your biggest, you, you call them inner inquisitors, which I really like. I, I use the press field resistance yeah. uh, word because I think it sums it up very well. But uh, what, what, what about you? Well, that's a big one for sure. Um, I try and when it comes to solving that, what I try and do is I, I think of um, art endeavors just like any other physical endeavor that would require physical work, like something like going to the gym or playing soccer for some reason, I think there's a tendency to think that creative stuff is, is different, that you should just be able to sit down and like create something, just create something. Um, and then when it doesn't work out, you, that's where that feeds the imposter syndrome. But like, if you go to the gym and if you're a first timer at the gym, you're not going to bench press 200 pounds. Like you're just not going to do it. You, you physically can't. And I think with creativity and art, there are some things a beginner just can't do. Like you're just not good enough yet. Not, not good enough. You don't have the muscle yet. So when it comes to the imposter syndrome, know that you can do it. You might not be able to do it right now. You just have to build to it. So if you want to write a novel, don't start with the novel. Start with like short stories or start with like, you know, tiny little poems or I don't know what, what it is. Start with something, you know, like uh, that creativity book. Uh, you asked me if I consider myself a writer. I mean, not really. I guess technically I am because I, I wrote a book, but I that book was not ever meant to be a book. If I sat down one day and said, I'm going to write a book, I would have failed because I would have known that I'm not a writer and I'm not a novelist or I've never written a book. So I probably would have stopped because the thing was too big that I was doing. But instead, I just focused on uh, like one small thing. Like uh, initially, that book was supposed to be a, a few blog posts. So I was writing when I sat down, I was just writing a blog post and I wrote one and then I wrote another one. And then I wrote another one and then, and then like three or four blog posts in, I'm like, you know what? I think this would be a better book. And like, I built myself up to the challenge and you can do the same with any creative medium. Like if you're a filmmaker, you don't, you know, probably don't start with a feature film, start with like a little music video or something like a little film essay or, you know, a YouTube video, just start small. And then, you know, with experience, suddenly you'll be able to tackle all the rigors that come with a, a feature or, or whatever. So 
that's a big one. So I think that's how to solve the imposter syndrome is just know that everyone needs to build up to where they are. And just because your favorite artist is able to illustrate beautiful 50 page graphic novels, it doesn't mean that you should start there because you'll probably fail. Uh, and, and failure is good, by the way. But um, we can talk about that if you if we want in a moment. But start small and don't bite off more than you can chew. Sorry, I, I know I'm talking a lot, but I had a student once. This is hilarious. And uh, I won't mention his name, although this is all in good humor. Uh, if he's listening, I had a student uh, who's and I have an assignment where you have to do your own illustration. Like in my class, I teach at CGMA. And in that class, we talk about fundamentals for like five weeks straight. And then on week six, the assignment is like, do a painting of your own creation. And, uh, you know, do a painting that applies these fundamentals like shapes, values and edges and color and all this stuff. So my student, one of my students comes back and he's like, he, he wants to do a, a painting of like knights on horses pillaging a burning medieval village at night. And I'm like, dude, don't do that. <laughs> like you will kill yourself doing that. And so many students do this. And I get, and, and like, sometimes I get frustrated and I'm like, why would you try that? Because you just know that you are going to get desperately lost. And not that there's anything wrong with getting desperately lost, but like, just take one section of that. Try like illustrating one night on a horseback riding over a hill at night. Do that. Start there. Then build up to the burning medieval village with 10 horseback riders raiding a village like build your way up. Um, that's how you build confidence. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there is something to be said about giving yourself manageable goals, like goals that you can actually achieve. So you feel like you've, you know, hit a victory, small goals along the way, setting yourself up with this, you know, writing a novel or creating that, which sounds like a pretty cool painting. I want to see that painting, (laughs) but, um, everybody wants to see knights pillaging a town, but, uh, I'm sure he's still working on it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but exactly. That's the that's the point. You need to set up set yourself up for those um those rewards, those times where you can have a celebration of creating this small thing. Um, because if you have that huge goal, um, it's gonna take you so long and most likely you're gonna get too demoralized and quit along the way. And then who knows where that will you know, that'll probably stop your whole creative career. Yeah, exactly. And like I think imposter syndrome relates to so many things. I'm I'm glad you brought it up, young man. I you know, I think that uh you should also not compare yourself to your heroes or your art heroes right away. Uh, you know, don't, there's a, there's a, some, I can't remember who said it, but there's a quote that, that says, you know, just be a better version of you tomorrow. Uh, sorry, I butchered that. I can't remember the quote. I shouldn't have even brought it up. <laughs> it's something like, don't compare, don't compare yourself to the master painter. Now compare yourself to who you were yesterday. That's a butchering mm-hmm. as well, but um, it's true. Like don't, you know, don't feed your own imposter syndrome by saying, oh, man, I'm just not as good as John Singer Sargent. Well, that's just not a healthy way to think. Like, just think about who you were yesterday and and get slowly better. And probably one day, maybe one day you will be as good as Sargent or whoever. Right. And also, like, obviously, we're we're all inspired by other people. Like, you know, I want to write like Stephen King or I want to mm-hmm. write like, you know, David Sedaris or I want to paint like Van Gogh. Like, mm-hmm. Of course, we're going to have those inspirations, but it's like almost looking forward to, like you said, it's not a straight line to becoming like that person. And it's, and it's like almost anticipating and like really waiting to see which way you veer off, you know, which, which thing excites you, which difference that you make as you're creating, um, that leads you down a different path and then embracing that path and then becoming something completely different. It's like try having that like guidepost, having that, that, that big mountain of a goal that you want to get to in the distance and then just really looking forward to seeing like where you um, stray from that, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just don't, don't try and preordain your own path to success uh, when it comes to, you know, becoming an artist because chances are you won't take that path. And when, when you're confronted with that fork in the road, you will probably despair over it or you might get worried about it or trepidatious and you might stop like so just don't even place the expectation just just draw just learn from the artists you like and and if you encounter like something that you didn't expect like go go for it like with with me you know getting back into 3d has changed the way i thought i never would have thought that i would have gotten back into 3d but here i am i I didn't plan for it but i'm riding that wave and you know finding time for things that's a that's like a life management skill that I have to work on just like anyone else. Uh, my wife really helps me with that. Uh, when I was single, I would just spend, you know, 12 hours a day on this. But now, you know, my my wife would kill me if I did that. So I've, I've had to like tighten up my time management. That's another thing. But 
you know, when it comes to, if you discover something, a path that you feel like you should take, do what you have to do to find the time to do it is my advice. It's hard. It's vague advice. I know it's hard, but that's what it takes. Yeah. Just like finding your own style, you have to find your own structure for, for life. And I, I, I wanted to actually ask you about that mm-hmm. balancing being married. I'm married myself mm-hmm. with introversion. Like you mentioned in your book, like you kind of realized that, and I think you used a John Irving quote to, to help you realize this, um, that like you are happiest when you're alone, <laughs> yeah. you know, like that's how Irving found out that he was a writer is that, you know, that's when you're happy being able to like spend time alone to get to your creative passion. And that's where you get your energy. Um, so I was wondering how do you balance that? Um, because I think that's something that people often have a tough time balancing is they really want to get to their creative passion, but they do have to go to work. They do have all these other life things. And then on top of that, they have commitments to, to family, to, to friends, to pets, to uh, children, to whatever, you know? And it's like, almost like you're, if you get to yourself, if you treat yourself kindly and, and give yourself energy and get to your creative passions and make yourself happier that way, it's almost like you're letting down those relationships. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So while I don't have the definitive answer, because everyone's life is different. um, What I can say and what I talk about a little bit in the book is in the uh, I call it the in the section called proclivity just and John Irving helped me think about this is just noticing the environment in which you are at your best. So at the, at a basic level, some people are introverts, some people are extroverts. We can start there. I'm definitely the introverted type. So I'm a better person when I'm alone or when I'm with my wife or close friends, you know, I don't have to be literally alone. Like right now, my cat's here keeping me company, but um, my dog as well. (laughs) Oh, nice. Yeah. So, you know, I'm at my best when I'm in a enclosed space on my own and I can be free to paint or, or write or, you know, explore thoughts. So what I do is to the best of my ability, I try and create that environment for myself. So in real life, what that looks like is I went freelance. I didn't always, I I didn't go freelance from the start because that's untenable because I needed to have connections in the industry. So at first, my first like seven years of being an artist, a professional artist, I was working in animation studios, but I always knew that I didn't want to be in the animation studio as much as it was cool to learn from people. And I had, I certainly had fun there. I knew I'd be better in all aspects of life, if I were just on my own. So I found a way, like in those seven years, I worked at finding a way to create the environment where I could go on my own. So I, uh, you know, I made contacts, I started freelancing while still working at the animation studios. And then one day I, I felt like I had a viable chance of doing that. Like I had enough kind of external work that I'm like, you know, maybe I can sacrifice my, my day job and, and build up this freelance thing. So I did it. It, took me like seven years, but I did it. And I've been freelancing now for maybe five or six years since then. And I am definitely like my art has flourished because of it. My ironically, my social life has flourished because now, you know, if I'm alone for the whole day, I feel fulfilled. I feel like I've been the best version of myself. So when my wife does get home from work, I feel like I'm, I'm ready to leave my room. But, you know, you ask anyone who knows me, if I'm like, if, if you don't let me paint for days on end, I get fidgety, I get I get restless and I'm not I'm not I'm not the best version of myself. So my advice is like foster, find a way to foster an environment for yourself that allows you to be the best version of yourself. And that just takes introspection. Everyone's different. If you're an extrovert, maybe you need an environment where you're challenged and with socially with other artists like you have to find that environment. So like everyone's different and everyone's life is different, like we talked about. So But that's the thing you have to do. You have to find out where you're at your best. That's like, that should be like your number one job as an adult is finding where you're at your best and then putting yourself in that place. Right. And just like, you know, developing your skills. Yeah. (laughs) Like it does, you won't be able to figure it out right away. It does take those trials and errors and just analyze your feelings and realize like why you're unhappy. Is it because you actually just hate your job or is it because you hate doing this type of art? (laughs) You know, like try to journal. I I always suggest journaling, Mm -hmm. you know, figuring it out that way. And then, like you said, try to get that structure of your life to fit around your happiness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, I should take your advice on journaling, young man. Even though I I write a lot, I don't journal at all. So I really should start doing that. Yeah. I always say either get a therapist or journal. (laughs) Be your own (laughs) therapist, (laughs) you know? Nice. Before we let you go, I also wanted to ask you about Cindy. 
um, mm. which was this just lovely uh, video that I think you and somebody else made. Is that right? Yeah, that's my uh, friend and best man at my wedding, Bryce Sage. Oh, cool. Okay, so can you talk about that story? Like, where did that idea come from? And then what was the process of creating it like? So uh, that's another one of those things where um, we never set our our sights on making a short film. I just did a painting one day of this girl who who was like holding hands with a, a skeleton who had clearly just been burned alive. And uh, <laughs> I, it just it just came out one day like it was a painting that just came out as a sketch. And uh, you can find that sketch online still. And I thought, hey, maybe like, you know, as I was painting, I'm like, maybe she's cursed with this thing where every boy that tries to date her, you know, at the first touch, he burns to flames. I have my, so my friend Bryce Sage is a professional writer and, um, I, he's, a, he's, a, he's also my workout buddy. So at the gym, like the next day I showed him this painting and I'm like, you know, what do you think of this little fairy tale, like a dark fairy tale? And like, we were both creative minds, right? So we, we couldn't help, but start exploring that idea. Like, oh, this can happen and this can happen. Again, the thing everyone is born with the, the desire to explore stories, so we, you know, within like a, an hour, we had all these these cool ideas of fa- of things that could happen. It was still wasn't a film though. We we just thought we were just having fun, and then you know, I, I don't know how long after that we just thought, hey, why don't we like try and make this into a story? And then we didn't know is it a book? Is it a movie? What is it? We decided then maybe the best format for it would be a short film because he's he's also a professional editor. He's done both writing and editing, so we can leverage his skills in that department. And I know a few things about editing as well from going to film school and making some films myself and then also, you know, leverage my skills as an artist and let's combine forces and bring this thing to to a film. The story itself was, uh, I mean, other than inspired by that initial sketch, we started digging into, uh, well, mostly his life in failed dating. (laughs) Mine too, but he's got some great stories of uh, dating fails. So we started there. And then we just started finding, you know, just like any story, we started finding like thematic truths in it and how, well, um, it, it changed. It, it's, it's a story that I don't really want to, I mean, people can interpret right. it how they want. Um, we definitely had something in mind as we created it, but, um, you know, thematically it's essentially about when your life doesn't quite go as you planned. And in this girl's case and Cindy's case, it's, you know, her trying to find love. She can never keep a guy alive um and she has to figure out why and how and that's the theme of the movie um so that's where we tied it into our own lives yeah and it definitely it it wraps up very nicely and i don't want to give anything away either but I, i really enjoyed watching it and uh bravo to you guys for creating it and also i i just i was recently speaking with cat rabbit and she was talking about how she and another artist saw each other's work and decided to collaborate. Mm -hmm. And I think that that happens a lot with creative people. Like you find this for you, he was your best man. Like, you know, like you were, you've been friends for a long time, but for a lot of people, when they encounter another creative person that is kind of like-minded and you're like, Oh, let's, let's create something like that's pretty much where it stops. Like you get this great idea to, Oh, we got to work together and then nothing ever comes from it. And then like, I think the advice there is like, okay, you know, uh, look at this sketch. Oh, it could be this story. And then going with it, like yeah. immediately starting, starting doing work and just not worrying about what, it, okay, is this going to end up being like a full feature film? Is this going to be a short film? Is this just going to be a series of drawings? Are we going to make a web comic or like, you know, whatever, just start working, start getting back to like we were talking about just being a kid and just, yeah. you know, figuring out <laughs> where this thing could find a place in the world. Exactly. Like explore the idea. Don't think about financial rewards or the the form it's going to take. Like you said, just explore the idea for the sake of exploring the idea. I mean, that's, that's the, that's creativity is exploring if it, it if the two are synonymous to me and then, yeah, you'll find a form for it, be it a web comic or, or whatever that, that, that comes later. Absolutely. Uh, Marco, well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I can't let you go, though, Mm -hmm. until you give us the final push. And this is where I ask you to reach through the microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already really inspired today and just give them your best final words of advice and really push them to pursue their own creative passions. Okay. Put something on paper and when you do, tell yourself out loud that it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't even have to be right. Just put it down. 
we talked about this already. I'm just kind of reiterating, but that's the, that's honestly my advice. If you're an, if you're a painter, go outside, find a scene you like, and sketch it, and tell yourself before you sketch it that it doesn't even have to be good as long as you put something down. Because the second you put something down, and you put down a, a sketch. You can then look at it and now you're engaging your creative mind You, because when you look at what you've done as a whole, you can't help yourself but start to look at it and say, oh, maybe I could change that. Oh, this is this work. Maybe I can do more of that. You will all these little equations will start you know, filtering in your mind. But if you don't do anything, then nothing will ever happen. So it's better to create bad stuff than it is to not create anything. So get out there whatever your discipline is, open a notebook and write or get out a sketchbook and paint or draw, just put something down and then look at it the next day and let your brain explore. And and that is where you will find your creativity more than anywhere else. Absolutely. Like that, like we were talking about before, the difference between creativity and art, like mm-hmm. you talk about in your book, it's like we all have it. We all can see a tree and see the beauty in it, <laughs> but it's you don't become an artist until you actually make art, <laughs> until you actually get it down and start working on it. Yep, that's exactly it. Margo, man, thank you so much for coming on the show today, for giving us that push. I really appreciate it, my friend. Oh, thanks so much, Youngman, for having me on. This was uh, a blast to speak with you, and I hope your listeners can benefit in some way from our conversation. They definitely will. They definitely will. And again, uh, you can find Marco on his website, marcobucci.com, B-U-C-C-I.com. On YouTube, he is Marco Bucci, and uh, we will have everything we talked about today, including where to get uh, his book, Creativity in the Campfire, as well as all the YouTube videos that we mentioned, all the resources at yourcreativepush.com slash Marco. Marco, thanks again. Thanks so much. Huge thank you once again to Marco for coming on the show. Two of the things that he talks about a lot in his videos and two of the things that he talked about a lot today were these ideas that I want to touch on, um, the idea of planning and also after you're done uh, a postmortem. Now, the planning phase is something that is unique to every individual out there. No matter what you're doing, you have to know yourself and what you are trying to say with your art or with your writing or whatever it may be. That comes with practice and experience uh, of doing the thing over and over again and starting to develop your voice and figure out what you want to say, but also through that experience, you realize where your stumbling blocks are, uh, where things start to go wrong, maybe where things start to go very right for you in your creative process, maybe knowing where some of the doubt starts to creep in, or where some of your technical stumbling blocks may start to rear their ugly head. Knowing all of these things in advance will really help you to make the most effective use of your creative time, your valuable creative time. Again, it's unique for every person. That's going to require you to practice planning, to practice planning so that you know what to expect while you're creating. And then the planning phase gets easier when you take the time after you're done a piece to do that postmortem, to go back like a, like a sports analyst and look at the game that you just played to see where you made mistakes, to see where you wasted time, to see where you got caught up on something. And instead of kind of making a decision and going for something, you perhaps overthought things and took way too long and maybe messed up a part of the piece. I don't know. It's individual for every person. But the more you take that time afterwards to look back, of course, not be a perfectionist and of course, not be ultra critical of yourself but to really analyze where your thought process was as you were creating it. So the next time you create a piece and you're in the planning phase, you can be ready to face those challenges. Ah, the circle of life, the circle of art. And again, I just can't recommend his book, uh, Creativity in the Campfire, enough while you're waiting for the Your Creative Push book to come out. Uh, This is definitely one you can pick up for some inspiration and to think about creativity in a different way. We'll have it linked up at yourcreativepush.com slash 312 if you want to pick that up, as well as everything we talked about with Marco, and also links to next week's guest, Jordan Hill. Jordan is an illustrator and storyteller, and she's created a universe, this alternate reality called the World of Immensum. She created illustrations as well as stories to go with them to create this complete world (laughs) that she has immersed herself in. 
So we had a really fun time talking about how it came to be as well as some of the other resistances that she deals with. If you want to find out more about Jordan, you can head to her website, worldofimensum.com. That's I-M-M-E-N-S-U-M. And also on Twitter and Instagram, she is World of Immensum. And of course, we'll have that all linked up at today's show notes page, yourcreativepush.com slash 312. But that's all I've got for you today. So hopefully you were inspired to go and get your creative work done, to spend some time with the planning and to spend some time with the postmortem. I love you all so much. Go get some amazing work done and we'll see you next week. Bye. Never miss a push. Head to yourcreativepush.com slash subscribe to find the easiest way for you to subscribe to the podcast.